For any of you who have not heard Craig talk before, uh, and has a sensitive nature, he does tend to use expletives.
guess why. Um, <laughs> and it's a small studio, there's four of us, including me, and we've got a dog um, called Aggie. She's a ball terrier, she's brilliant. Um, my dog, my dog. And we kind of, I set up this, this we're actually in its 10th year, I realised the other day, it gave me absolute fucking shivers, really. I didn't think I'd make it 10 minutes. But 10 years, I've been sort of doing this on my own. And I was working in agencies before that, and I left agencies in a kind of crime and passion of like, fuck this, I'm off. I don't want to do this anymore. And I wanted to do a rich and varied kind of diet of things. You know, I wanted to teach, I wanted to write more, I wanted to do projects that I initiated to find my own audience, and I also wanted to work more with cultural kind of clients and do that kind of work. And I had no fucking money, I had no studio, I had no fucking idea what I was doing, but I'm still doing it now. It's kind of miraculous, really. And again, this is not here to say, oh, fuck me, I'm great. It's more like, if I can fucking do it, you'll all be fine. Because <laughs> I am useless. I'm a shit designer. And uh, yeah, I am, you're laughing, I'm not fucking crap. <laughs> um, I just sort of fumble my way through it. And I'm also really good at kind of talking about stuff that makes it sound better than it might actually be. Um, but the practice runs exactly like that. We all, I've got two designers, Dee and Alice. Um, Dee's graduated a year ago from Manchester School of Art. Alice came in 2020, she was one of the lockdown lot um, that came from Sheffield Hallam. And they teach as well, they have their own projects. The, the studio gives them time and money to make their own projects, whatever they are. Alice had launched a kind of thing called the Outside Directory, which you can check out, which is outside.directory. And it's about in, uh, just basically it's a massive fucking database of studios and agencies and designers and illustrators and people working in creative industries that are outside of London. Um, and that is just something Alice wanted to do. And I was like, you should do it. And she did it. And that's kind of what, how we run really. There's no fucking rules. We don't really know what we're doing. It's just like, that feels good, let's do it. Which leads me to this, which is another business that I'm involved in, Rough Trade. Uh, I'm creative director of Rough Trade Books, uh, the publishing arm, which is, and there's a record label and shops and the book stuff. And that is very much the same, like, that feels good, let's do it. Um, they're interested, let's publish them. They've got something to say, let's put that out. And it's been kind of a brilliant move for me, but also like another one of those channels of not doing the same thing day in, day out as a studio might do or an agency having this kind of weird, because they're, they're, they're almost like a client. We all work on them, but we don't, we don't necessarily get paid for it, do you know what I mean? Because we work for them, it's the fucking weird, so you never know what app you've got on. And you're just like, am I doing that today, am I doing that today? And all this shit just mingles in there. But it makes it really exciting. And Rough Trade is a great kind of company. They're trying, you know, we're not trying to do anything radical. It's not like something we set out to sort of change publishing for the better, because publishing is, exploitative fuck like as an industry. Like if you're an author, the deals you get, unless you're, you know, Stephen King or something and you can sell a million books without getting out of bed, like you fucked in publishing. And Rough Trade didn't want to sort of come into publishing and address that, they just wanted to do something and put some content out in a different way. And what they do is like the first ever Rough Trade record deal is after costs are covered, everything is split 50-50 and it's the, the whole deal is completely fair. We try and publish people that are on the periphery of publishing, they're either trying to break into the industry and we're doing it for a while, or they, we give them their first shot at doing it. We publish a lot of first time authors. And we also work with a lot of people that are really established, but they don't really have space to have ideas that they, you know, they might want to do, or that people have rejected from them. So we work with people like Jarvis Cocker and people like that who wants to write this whole polemic slash DJ set on how much he fucking hated Brexit. But ironically, the Rough Trade record label were like, whoa, whoa, we're not putting that, we'll, just, we'll, we'll do it, we'll do it. <laughs> so, it's a kind of a schizophrenic existence, I guess. I have to do sort of opposite creative stuff and Rough Trade stuff, but the thing that ties it all together is, is, is like the principle of the thing, the approach. It's not a way of doing things, it's more like a, it's who I am. It's, it's, it's my values and my morals, and they're represented in the businesses I work with and my business itself. And that is a really privileged position, I'm aware, but it's also like the thing that keeps me doing this. I remember saying to somebody when I was um, a junior, like, fucking hell, if I'm doing this in 10 years, I don't, I don't want to live. You know? And here I am. 
<laughs> longer than that, still doing the same fucking thing. And I'm, I'm, you know, I was brought up like my mum and dad were always like, if you can fucking whinge about it, you can do something about it. And here I am, still whinging, <laughs> not doing anything. So that's kind of, um, yeah, the sort of like where, I'm, where I come from kind of thing. So the slide, like how I know these two fuckers <laughs> down here. I mean, James explained it already, so. Um, Christy and I have not met until last night at all, but we shared a lovely little cuddle, we had an embrace. Group <laughs> 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 um, and ten pints. We went away, we were like, we've known each other forever. But yeah, it was, it was great. I mean, I, I always love how, I'm, I'm really critical of the design industry, I am, because it's got massive fucking problems that need addressing with diversity, with kind of gender imbalance, with pay, with all of these things that need fucking talking about a lot more than they are. But it is a fucking wonderfully friendly community. It is really close. And I think that's how I genuinely know these two down here. Like, I always knew Jamie and Jim's work, like, even when I said a little bit older than me. Um, Jim's more older than me. <laughs> um, and followed their work and I loved it and I kind of wanted to emulate that and you know probably wanted I guess somewhere in there probably want to work with them um, that never materialized but I remember when I was in the agencies and stuff and we crossed paths at various talks and been out for beers and things like that and really got on and that means a lot to me really that I can call these two people friends but also I remember when I was going through that I you know the, the crime and passion fuck this I'm off tables turning over walking out of studio I remember speaking to these two people and asking them for advice. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know how to set up an agency. I didn't even know if that was what I wanted. And I remember getting counsel from both of them independently, going for lunch with Jamie, going for a beer with Jim, going to the studios, and them giving me the time, and them giving me their advice, and them just listening. And that you'll find that in the industry quite a lot, and I'll be forever in debt to their kind of generosity for that, because it's not something I forget easily. So I, I am genuinely lucky to have them and be able to look at 10 pints of pizza we have on the night in Preston. Which is generally how we operate now as friends. I mean, James in Bath, Abbey, Manchester, Jim's in London. And we generally just find ourselves in these random cities in the UK or abroad doing a talk and going, let's go get pissed. Which is how, how we roll. So that's how I know them. Um, and ideas, the, the, as I said, the next slide was like what we mean when we talk about ideas, I guess, uh, and our kind of definition of it. Which, you know, again, James articulated very well, and I don't think I can. Because um, I don't really know. I thought I did this morning. I was like, yeah, I fucking can answer that. And now I'm not so sure after lots of James, you know, crippled the insecurity. <laughs> and because um, I think ideas, wrongly, if I can say it, and this is where Andy might come running at me and fucking die. But, <laughs> like the whole smile in the mind thing. Like, I think that has, I think that has value, don't get me wrong, but I feel like that has pigeonholed what an idea is, or how we talk about ideas. I think that can limit what we think an idea is. Because to me, an idea isn't a visual thing. It's not, a, it's not a bit of negative space, and it's not a graphic, and it's not the kind of thing. For me, ideas are what we think about them as a kind of definition of the dictionary. It's an intellectual thing. It happens in your head. And it doesn't have to be one thing. And I think we talk about it in a singularity, which I think is unhelpful. I think we talk about this thing like, oh, have you got a big idea? An idea that runs through one thing. One thing that runs through another one thing. And I don't think that's very helpful sometimes. Because I think ideas can be many different things, and I think they can change as you do with them, and I think they don't have to be static. And actually, I think an idea that comes out can have an intention but then can be received by an audience or a public or whatever or a community and become something else. And, it, and I, I quite like that. You know, like a, a musician, for example, might have an idea for a song and they will make that song and they will put it out into the world. But the way that, it, but the way that you might interact with it, it you, t you add to it, you add meaning to it. And I think the idea becomes something else. And I find that far more interesting than doing a fucking bit of white space in a letter and, you know, making a nice little one hit kind of trick. I'm not saying that I don't value that because I really, really do. And I 
think it's really, really great, but I also think it's about time we start talking as design in a much bigger context because I think we can be far more impactful and far more interesting and far more involved in a lot more other stuff than the visual. And to me, that is much more interesting. So when I talk about ideas, I am generally quite airy fucking fairy about taking up here and, you know, the rarefied air of what something could actually do, the power that something can have to move someone in whatever fucking guise it comes in, and it doesn't have to be weighted down with graphics. I don't want to, even though I am a designer, I don't want to be weighed down with this idea that I can only come up with visions, that I can only have visual ideas, or that my thinking can only materialise visually. Because I just I don't want to do that. What if I want to write something? And, you know, Jamie talked really convincingly and really compellingly about writing being an idea. But I think it, it can still be treated with a bit of kind of we think it's academic, you know, we think it's not creative, we think it's over there. Like same way you treat sports, you think people that buy football are fucking stupid. It's like it's not like you don't work like that. It's not it's, it's far more complex. So that's what I mean really. And I was given value at the at our own raffle like I got value, the value of ideas. And, it's, and, and the more I thought about this, I, like I said this morning, I was like, ah, oh, that's fine, that's a piece of piss, we can talk about that, I'm a principal guy. Um, but it is really, really complicated, I think, to start talking about what value ideas can have. <coughs> and I think ultimately, it's, that's because we're stuck in this fucking bin called capitalism. Um, here we go, Marxist lecture. <laughs> you at the back, can you bring up the big red flags, please? <laughs> like, whether you fucking like it or not, and whether you want to have a fight outside about it or not, <laughs> graphic design wouldn't fucking exist without capitalism. End all. We, we get paid to make money for fucking other people, largely, or ourselves. So, fucking live with it, basically. Or, or if you don't, if you, you know, if you, if you don't like the system, don't depend on it. Go to do something else. And we have to square this off that our, ultimately, rightly or wrongly, our, our ideas of value are always intrinsically they always come back to fucking money. And it's kind of it's kind of disheartening, really, a bit disgusting. And what we do as graphic designers, like I say, I mean, it used to be called commercial art, and there's your fucking clue, you know, right there. <laughs> using creative talent to make cash. It's not an expressive thing. Graphic design is not self-expression. It doesn't belong anywhere near it. Um, because ultimately, somewhere along the line, even kind of charitable work in some shape or form involves a transaction of cash. So that for me is, is something, and that's not necessarily something I've got an opinion on, or well, I have an opinion on it, I just fucking told you. But <laughs> like, it's more, throwing that out there for you to be aware of and I think it's just something that we all have to kind of square up because I think if you if you are I mean I am unbelievably left you know not so left I'm going right but I'm very I do like struggle with it sometimes I don't really I'm not that interested in money I hate the fact that everything does come down to it and I want to build things that don't depend on money that have more value and are more valuable in them than, than just cash but people have to get paid it's a, it's, a stuff, it's a really tough thing to get your head around, but ideas have to operate in that kind of system. So that's like the first thing you know, that you have to square off with yourself and find your own way through. The other thing I was I, I, that came into my mind about value and about ideas when you think about those two things together is ownership. And I always I always get a kind of really awful feeling when I hear, and this happens in my studio all the time. You hear, you'll have heard it yourselves, like someone talking about their idea as theirs, like that's my idea, this idea's mine. And then I think, fucking hell, what is it, we're in the nursery, you know? That's my toy, you know, fuck off. And I don't like that, I don't get that at all. Some of the best ideas that have happened, in, like I'm talking again, I'm in the rarefied air again, folks, flying. Like, some of the best ideas that have happened upon society are, are ideas that somebody had fucking years ago and then someone else has just picked it up and technology's changed or, you know, a vision's happened or someone's read something and gone, let's put that into, into that real life. They didn't give a fuck, they want their idea. You know, if, you, if, you, if you're convinced that creativity is solely about this kind of 
idea of pure originality. If you value yourself only on originality and that you are the complete and only source for creativity, I think that's fame, it's vanity that you think you're that good, you know, that you think you're the only person that can have an idea because you call yourself a designer. Fuck off. Everybody can have an idea. And it doesn't matter who has it or what happens. So I find that quite weird and I, and I, and I, I try and foster all the time this, this collaborative nature and I don't mind that if somebody does come up with something and it, and it sparks something, but ultimately everything is connected to everything else. You don't just pluck this shit out of thin air. You're not fucking aliens, do you know what I mean? It's ultimately a, a combination of stuff. The remix thing that Jamie was on about, that's happening before you've even been asked to have a brief, all this stuff that's going on. And it's not yours, is it? It's because you listen to music and it inspires you to do something. Give the fucking music some credit, for fuck's sake. Why don't we talk about that? Why do we always talk about, I have this idea? It's just an idea. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying that, I mean, I've probably done that loads of times. I'll probably do it in the middle of this fucking talk. But I think it's interesting to sort of have this discussion about what we actually mean when we're talking about that kind of thing. And, and I, think, yeah, I think it's, you owe it to yourself really to open up about these ideas and entertain them. Because you might learn something new about yourself, and I think that's always good. You know, like, if you haven't changed your mind lately, how do you know it's still working? Kind of thing. So, yeah, what, 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 what's next? What is, here we go. So, two, two things, I guess, that's going to hopefully segue, 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 <laughs> segue into me showing you some actual shit, um, which I don't really like doing, which is why I'm stood here talking about, you know, crap market. Like, um, I don't really like using these things as showing work, because it's kind of like, it's boring. I, I, I find work a bit testing, really. I don't, the last thing I want to do is talk about something that kicked me ass for months, you know. <laughs> Um, and it does, doesn't it? You know, you, you work fucking hard at trying to make this stuff great, whatever else. And I don't want to break from that. I don't want to just suddenly get it hard again. It's like confronting your abusers, the way I always call it. <laughs> Talk about that thing. No, 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 I don't want to. But back to this shit. Like, what do we value? Like, as a society, You'll, you'll notice as you, as you sort of, you'll, you're probably aware of it already, like you've, as society shifts and moves and ebbs and flows and things go up and down, in all kind of walks of life, discussions about value happen, you know, discussions about value happening now, about cost of living, about, you know, what do you value enough, is it eating or eating, you know, they're all conversations about value. Ultimately they always come back to money, but there's, there's lots of conversations we need to have about ourselves as an industry and as a society. And I think you as, you as designers need to start having this conversation with yourself and as a group of, you know, as a group of peers. What do we actually value? What kind of, what shit do we want for out of the world? Because if you are just contributing to this kind of capitalist economy, you've got to be aware that you're actually, you might, you might be the fucking problem. Do you know what I mean? And I think, again, it's healthy to, to acknowledge that. If you're going to put something out into the world, you should really value what it is you, you're putting out there. Because if you can't stand by it, you shouldn't be doing it. I know that's a really kind of black and white harsh way of doing it, and I know the world's complex. But again, there's something to think about, something to do. So, really, really do push yourself to understand your own principles. What do you value? It's not an easy thing to answer that. You might have a couple of things straight away, like, yes, that. But there's a lot of other stuff when you start really digging into it and having conversations with each other. But what do you value in your work? What's the most important thing? Is it an idea, or is it something else? This idea that's going on at the minute, this kind of decoration thing, if I'm honest, I don't think that's particularly correct. You know, is decoration the opposite of communication? Probably not. They're one and the same. They can be. Decoration can communicate. So do you value that? I don't know. I just think you've got to have a really open mind about things. And I think, them, again, I'm just fucking piggybacking you all the way through this talk, mate. Sorry. <laughs> what Jamie said. Um, <laughs> like, you know, this people who are really fucking set in what they do and what they think, and this is right and that's fucking wrong, like, are usually really boring and really kind of, and always, in my experience, probably wrong. Like, shit, I have poor opinions, they're poorly informed, not very well read. Um, and probably a dickhead. Um, <laughs> and that, I think half the time that's because they don't have this kind of healthy, ongoing reflection on themselves and what they value, what their principles are, what kind of work they do, what does that work that they do say about themselves. And you've got to do that. 
like you you lot emerging from this kind of this course with a portfolio of work. That portfolio of work for me isn't an archive of everything you've done. Like here's what I did whilst I was at uni. It's a reflection of what kind of designer you want to be. And you're going out into the world with that, trying to find people, ideally, that, that share those opinions, that share those ideas, that share those values, and hopefully you get to work together. That's what a portfolio is to me. It's, a, it's like, this is the kind of work that represents me and what kind of stuff I want to do, what I'm interested in, what I value as in creativity, how I apply that val I apply those values, how they materialize. That's what it is about. That's what we do as professionals. Like, the work that we stand up here and show you ultimately is a manifestation of something we believe in, otherwise we won't fucking show you. You know, and I think that's all it is. So keep an eye on that. Because without, like, principles, Without opinions, you've not really got anything else. You know, you, there's no differential marker there. Everybody can do this kind of job, really. It's design. Bit. Design is actually the kind of easiest bit about it, even though I it. Like, because it, it, there's a lot of other stuff that needs to happen for an idea to get through. There's a lot of other stuff that needs to happen to have ideas, and being aware of stuff does help. So one of the things I value, and that I'm going to, that you know, leads basically lets me talk about books I've done. Uh, is books. Like, I'm yet to find a better dispenser for ideas than books. I think they are almost a perfected technology. They've been around for centuries. And I'm, you know, there's books that have changed the fucking world. And I don't mean that as, a, as an overstatement. Like, the Bible, for fuck's sake. I mean, just, just yeah, the fucking Bible. Fuck, I mean, I'm not. Yeah, let's not go there. <laughs> That's the fucking last thing you want. You <laughs> need to talk about the Bible. <laughs> but I will talk about this book. Because this, this, was, this book was released, it's a novel, so it's fiction. It was released in 1937. And it's, it's about a doctor. Um, and the, the whole thing is just about basically, it raises, it raises ideas and questions about kind of medical ethics. And, the ideas are about like how, as a society, if we if some people can access healthcare and others can't, what does that say about society? And ten years later, as a result of reading this book, we got the NHS. So that idea in that little book there gave us the NHS. Is you know all that stuff I've just been talking about is right there for me. It's in a book. Someone's had, there's a point of origination which we all value. But this, va this value in this idea has got bigger and bigger and bigger. Someone's picked up ideas and made something with them. That is probably, you know, in my opinion, the, the fucking best brand on the planet, like the NHS. And that is just an idea from a book. And these things, it's not one idea, it's multiple things. These things are in conflict. Obviously, the NHS is absolutely under duress right now because of the fucking Tories. Um, that's another thing we'll get into. <laughs> So if you're a Tory, please fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> just, just there, push. Um, and I want to talk about that because I really love books, and I think the books that I make, I don't. You know, I'm not saying any of my books have done this. Fucking hell, I've got started the NHS too. You know, like, but I want my books to sort of find an audience and maybe spark something off in them. And the books that I, I always have this kind of idea in my head of what I want these things to do. I never know, and I really like being open to that idea. I don't like having set ends of things. Because I think books particularly, a lot like films, a lot like music, they find their own audience effectively, and they roll. And, but everything I have to do has to have a reason, has to have a purpose, that's one of my values. And this one was about a lot of things really, but it was about my own background, but it was also me setting my stall out on what kind of what value I place and what creativity was, and I don't think creativity, as I've said, is is limited to designers. I don't think you're more creative than anyone else. So I, don't, I, don't, I think that's a really arrogant point of view. I think everybody is creative, and everybody can make it up, and everybody can have something to say. And we just do it for a living. That's the only difference. So this book was largely about that, like working class communities who people look down on in power and from certain other kind of power structures. It was willfully ignored that these people were creative, and that was about me reappraising that through a book. And this book on the miners' strike, you know, I, I had all those fucking designer tricks in there. You know, we made a typeface, and we, um, you know, we printed the cover. That cover's printed with coal from a 
think that my dad, my granddad worked out, which in itself is it's not a big idea, but it's a, it was a pretty moving <laughs> idea for me at the time to, to use material of my dad and my granddad and my family, you know, my great granddad and my entire community used to fight the earth to release from, from its surface to then use that to communicate something about our community. It was, was quite moving for me and quite powerful. But that's what I wanted to do with that book. You know, this book, um, What Shit, What Now, was me getting really fucked off with advice that you lot get. Um, work hard and be nice to people. Fucking use is that, really? <laughs> do you know what I mean? That everybody thinks they're nice in their own self. Nobody, think, nobody goes around saying, yeah, I'm a, I'm a twat. <laughs> 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 it'd be good if they did, you know. And everybody probably thinks that they work hard, whether other people do or not. So it, I think it's fucking useless. And and I don't think it's an intentional thing. I'm not I'm not slightly at it. It's just like I feel there are things that don't get said, and I feel that a lot of designers, like I said, the community that I was talking about with Jim and Jamie there, I genuinely believe in that. But I also feel that sometimes when we're time poor and we want to help we rush into it and we say things that just get repeated and endlessly cycle this same kind of regurgitated shit about advice and it becomes nostalgic and it's, it becomes useless so this was about just sort of correcting that from my own point of view and that's all it is it's just my own point of view put down in my own way um, where I just talked about all the things that I went through from being in school it sounds like a fucking memoir doesn't it <laughs> fuck it isn't a fucking memoir at all but um, and articulating those in a kind of really open way that I don't think was being done at the time. But again, that's that's me trying to put something out into the world. And then these are the ones I'm going to sort of doing, go into a bit more because these are like other people. This this is where I kind of where I am now, I guess, like culminated in I'm working with other people's <laughs> ideas to make my own ideas about ideas. It's a bit fucking nosebleed. And this does this is a kind of an, an idea. I struggle to talk about sometimes because I think it's a bit, I don't know, I'll, I'll have a bash, you tell me if I fucked it or not. Um, the, this is an idea for a series of books, not one book, not you know a, a collective of books that, that don't exist. So these books are in films, but they're not real books, they're, they're props. Um, there's the Beetlejuice there, Donnie Darko in the middle, The Shining, uh, and Mandy at the end. They're just four kind of ideas, but And they, all of them feature, in one way or another, a kind of a, a printed book or artifact that completely changes the story of the film that they're in. Um, has anybody seen any of those four films? Yeah. Yeah. Which one? All of them. All of them. Right. Well, that's not bad. You know what I'm fucking on about. Then. <laughs> so, I really love film. I really love the culture of film. I really love when you see other disciplines, everything, <coughs> other disciplines, and I really love that film. It's almost this kind of universal thing that everybody can enjoy on different kinds of levels. And I really love books. And I thought, I'm a, let's do something with both of those things. So the idea is to take something from films, these, these things that don't exist and make them real. And this is what I've been doing for the past few years, really. The first one we did was John Carpenter's They Live. Has anybody seen this? This is the one that not a lot of people. So this is like one of the shittiest films you can ever see. Um, it's, and you know, it, it is so shit, it, it's good for being shit. You know, they're those kinds of films, uh, like The Room. You're watching it and your fucking teeth are hurting, you know. It's like that. But it is actually a really fucking good film. And it is really well made, and it's really kind of, it's hammy and whatever else, but in this film, um, this happened. So the, the premise of it, for those that haven't seen it, is basically a bullshit B-movie, alien invasion thing. The aliens are living amongst us, you know, one of them, and we can't, we can't see them, we don't know who they are, but they're controlling us. Until some, a bunch of rebels make some sunglasses that when you put them on, you see the truth. That's what we're dealing with right here. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a shot from the film when the, the, the main character is a wrestler, like he was a wrestler at the time in the 80s called Rowdy Roddy Piper. And for the fucking rock and all that, wank, <laughs> this guy, he's fucking brilliant. Um, he's stumbled across this whole conspiracy thing. He's just a working class bloke, builder, and he puts these glasses on. And suddenly every single piece of media and communication 
reveals the truth, and it's all control mechanisms. So all this, they all said, obey, consume, marry and reproduce, honor apathy. All, all money says this is your god on it. And it's all, the world goes black and white. It's like a fucking reverse Wizard of Oz. Um, and you're not in fucking Kansas with this one. So what happens is, he picks, he walks past the newsstand in LA, you know, like where they have magazines and books and shit on the street level. And he picks up this magazine, and that's the front cover of it. And this is what our book is. So in this book, um, what we've done, the whole thing flips from back. This one here, actually, I brought one for the raffle. And let me get it, that's just one easy to show you. Uh, look at this, fucking Debbie McGee. You sort of fucking know Debbie McGee, isn't it? Um, like, the whole book, the whole premise of this, so it's a replica of what he picks up in the film. So these pages are all pages that you see that he, he goes through. At one point he takes the sunglasses off and that's what it looks like. This is a magazine prop um, that we had, we had access to in Universal Studios. So these are the actual props and then he goes back to the messaging when he puts the glasses back on. There's a moment where he takes them off and looks at it. So all this stuff happens. John Carpenter, the director, he wrote the foreword for it, and the, the kind of the main thing that happens in it is, you know, you, I'm sure you've all heard of Shepard Fairey, like Obey, that's where Obey comes from, this film, like he watched this and he used to watch it while he was doing his initial stencils in his bedroom, and he, he made the Obey the Giant stickers based on the film and his love of this film, so Shepard Fairey wrote an essay for this in this book, and we asked loads of other like cultural um, figures, I guess, like John Grant, Musician, he wrote about John Carpenter's music because the director makes his own music. Um, Slavo Zizek, the spitting philosopher, you know, he wrote a piece about it about ideology because he, he featured it in one of his documentary films. And I sort of wrote the, the book flips from black and white, so everyone else's stuff. Uh, Brandalism's in there as well, they wrote an essay on stuff. Uh, where it flips to black is where my essays come in, where I sort of critique the film and talk about the themes within the film, like the politics of it. It's, it's an absolute, you know, so it's a, it's, a, it's a real sea of things. The, the idea with these books is, it's like, I just kind of describe it as a cycle through If you know the film and you're into it, you'll recognize this book and you'll go into it. And you might come out of that with a new interest in street art or a new interest in philosophy or music or whatever. Fucking God knows what. Sunglasses. Or you might, like Shepard Fairey, think it's a fucking Obey book. <laughs> And then go, oh, I might watch that film. And then you're on that journey as well. And, I, and the book itself is like that. It's not just, it'd be a pretty fucking short book if it was just whatever you see in the film. It'd be like three pages, you know. So what I like about this is like the two halves of that circle are everything that, in the world that was going on that they referenced and pulled from to make the film. And then the film, and when the film was released, the cultural impact they had afterwards on people like Shepard Fairey. So when in this book, there's loads about female um, conceptual artists, people like Jenny Holzer, uh, Guerrilla Girls, Barbara Kruger, all of that reference is, is in the film and it's all present in there. And then of course, when it all comes out, it goes into other things. It's got, let me show you, that fucking weird shit. Um, you can't fucking see it anyway. There's hidden messages written, written all the way through the book um, that replicate the commands, it's done, it's done in a clear ink. You can't see it, you can kind of catch it in the light on these. And the whole book smells like bubblegum. Um, printed a scented bubblegum ink on the inside of the covers. So when you open it, you get a whiff of bubblegum. This is like my old copy now, so it's kind of gone. You know, that scratch and sniff kind of stuff. It's got to smell it a little bit. Um, and that's because in the film, the wrestler, like he was known for his like repartee and his quips and his talking, rather than his actual fighting. And he, the director said to him, just like, you know, use some of your lines, just make some stuff up when you're doing it. And he has got a line in the book where he, he breaks it, he's, he basically crusade and shooting all these fucking aliens with his sunglasses on. And he said, he comes into a bank and there's loads of them there. And he said, I've come here to uh, chew bubblegum and kick ass and I'm all that bubblegum. There's loads of them all. So that's why the whole thing smells like bubblegum. And that's, that, this is not one idea. I guess you could say it is one idea, but it's also a litter fucking bin of ideas of stuff 
hopefully it all might just give you an opportunity to just trigger another kind of bit of thinking or another bit of critical analysis or another kind of insight into something you might know. And the latest one I've done is The Shining. Um, I haven't got a copy of this, so you're not, you're not getting no demos. But uh, who's seen The Shining? Everyone at the back. <laughs> Fucking fan club up there. <laughs> so, who, so a lot of you haven't seen it, yeah? Who knows what The Shining is that they might not have seen it? A little bit more. Well, I'll fucking tell you anyway. <laughs> so The Shining is a Stanley Kubrick film. Does anybody know, not know what Stanley Kubrick is? That's better, isn't it? Andy, do you know what Stanley Kubrick is? Yeah. <laughs> the library, walking library there. Um, so this is a, Stanley Kubrick pretty much is one of the leading directors in, in kind of cinematic history. And he basically tried to do the archetypal masterpiece of every kind of genre. You know, he tried it on with drama, he tried to do a period piece, he tried a you know, comedy, he tried it, all of that, and this is his horror. And to be fair to Sam, he did a war film, you know, he, he probably achieved it, to be honest. Like, some people will say that this is the best horror film of all time. I fucking wouldn't, but I did write a book about it. So, this, what happens in The Shining, video please. I'm gonna show, I'm gonna play this one to you. So like I said, like the premise of these, the whole thing is, oh great. <laughs> uh, just hang on a sec. Uh, the premise of this, we've got sound on it as well. Yeah, the room, the room. Um, the whole entire thing, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, mate. Um, is all of these books, like I said, this is this is my rule of selection with them. They have to fucking do something. Like they have to be a catalyst within the story of the film. They have to change something or have some impact. Otherwise they're just a fucking random fun. You know like in The Simpsons, if you want who's seen the fucking Simpsons, you know. <laughs> <laughs> They always have all those really weird, stupid ideas of books and stuff and uh, all sorts of shit. It's, it's like, but they just throw away things. They can't be that, that's the rule. They've got to do something. In They Live, it's when he, it's, that's, it's, he picks that thing up, that's when he realises he's fucked. And, that's, and the whole film changes at that exact moment. In The Shining, the whole film is going on. And what The Shining is, again, for those of you that haven't seen it, it's basically a family go to look after a hotel that's shut down for the winter, it's really remote. So it's basically a lockdown, okay? And it's kind of haunted. And Jack is the dad, Jack Nicholson plays the dad. Um, Shelley Duvall plays the mum, and they've got a little lad called Danny. And the three of them are kind of slowly, as a family unit, crumbling under this pressure of, well, just, you know, being isolated and whatever else. And Jack's mental health is decreasing. But he's writing something all the way through the film. We never really know what. And he's slowly going fucking mad. Shelley's roaming around trying to keep the family together and Danny's just playing and going on his drive and slowly getting alienated from both his parents. And then this happens. She, Danny's been attacked by what we think is a ghost on screen. Jack's fucking AWOL. And then she walks into his writing room and finds this. Can you play now? Can I play? Yeah, can I fuck? <laughs>
How do you like it? <laughs> yeah, right, there we go. So, one for me, you, you, you empty yourself. Um, so, what we did with this, so that's, that's Jack's manuscript. I call it a manuscript because we've got no idea what the fuck it is. Really. We don't know if that's a novel, you know, it could be a bit avant-garde. We don't have to play it, which is what he's writing in the book. It's based on a Stephen King novel, which I would, by the way, for those of you who know. So, what we did with this, this is the front cover. The whole thing comes in a box, exactly the same dimensions, size um, of the actual prop, which you can see in the Stanley Kubrick archive in London, uh, which I did go and see and spent an awful lot of time with a fucking box of paper. Because uh, I'm a fucking knob. Um, <laughs> and this is the cover. So what we did is, you know, it's not a thing, but this is Jack's face and the iconic scene of him putting his head through the bathroom window and saying, here's Johnny, which again is a cultural reference I think everybody knows when they've seen the film on Raw. And the, the whole idea of this is that it, there's absolutely no binding whatsoever within the entire thing. So the whole thing is loose leaf. So that's one thing. <laughs> we, I sourced the typewriter that Jack uses in the film, which is a German typewriter from the uh, 60s. And we types we typeset loads of this and I was I was sat there doing it, following it, like looking at the thing on screen and like copying it. And I was like, I'm I'm never gonna see sunlight again. <laughs> so what I did was I digitized, punched it loads, every single character, every single punctuation, every single glyph, everything I could at different weights. So I'd like hammer it really hard, then a little less harder, then a little less harder, you know, really lightly. And I, Punch reams and reams and reams of this, scanned them in, and I sent them to a, a typographer who I worked with on the live actually, a guy called Tim Donaldson. And he created this coded typeface where it replicated how you would be sensitive on a typewriter using that typeface. So the typeface using this typewriter thing, all this, is the exact same as what would be in the film. Um, which is just, again, one thing. And, I, and that's not like, I'm not doing that as a, like a sort of honour to commitment or anything like that. I just think, if you're going to do it, do it fucking right, you know. It's as simple as that. It's, it's, a, it's a value system, again. Um, but this is what it looks like inside. There's also multiple stuff within it, because you, you basically, you, you have the DNA there given to you. You know what it looks like. You see the pages. And all these yellow pages are all essays that I wrote about the film. All of them single-sided. And the idea is a bit like the film. The film itself is, I mean, regardless if you think it's scary or not, regardless of whether it's good or not. For me, I, I, like I said, I don't think it's that scary. I'm not really interested in that. I think it's really good, but I don't think there's a, there's a better horror films. But what I do think is absolutely exceptional about this film is like what it does to audiences. And there's not another film like it. People read into this film like they've probably like they've never read into any other film before. They think it means certain things. There's, there's, if, you, if you go online, fuck me, you'll open up a right treasure trove of no cases. That, uh, that think it's about the Holocaust, that think it's about Native American genocide, that think, that think the whole thing's a fucking dream. People just, it's like a matrix, a system that people just populate with their own opinions. And what's, what's beautiful about it as a piece of cinema and as an idea is that it's, so, it's loose enough that if you feed it some evidence or if you come to it with your own opinions and suggestions and, and experiences, it will feed back to you. It'll confirm them. If you think it's about the Holocaust, you'll find shit in there that's German, that's about genocide, that, that you think is symbolic about those things. If you think it's about domestic abuse and domestic violence, because basically that's what happens to Jack, what tries to kill his fucking wife, you'll find evidence for that. It will cite it back to you. And it's, it's miraculous for that. And that's kind of what it's all about. So it's also got these kind of titles that interrupt it that are just black and it tells you what day it is. Like, you've just got fucking scariest Tuesday ever, you know, it just goes black because it's Tuesday and you're like, fucking hell. <laughs> so it just, it like shocks you. So those ones are, are like the same model as they live. They're all the cultural people that have waded in on this film and they're all, you know, people from a music background, like we've got, uh, what's his face from Uncle, he loves fucking Stanley Kubrick, so he talks about it. Cozy Fanny Tutti, the musician, but also a survivor of domestic abuse and domestic violence, and she talks about like women being in service of men, and we talk to fashion designers, I'm gonna go through this, but, and then there's a scrapbook element, 
There's a scrapbook on his desk. This scrapbook's full of all the hotels that are actual hotels that you can go and stay in that they borrow and all the kind of design from all the interiors and made their own hotel. There's a key fob in it, there's a fucking map in it that you see in the film, and then there's loads of other weird shit which I'm just going to talk about. So yeah, they're like my essays, but you can see like all the different weights and stuff. That's all like this random code that happens in the kind of typeface that Tim designed. This kind of replicated it all. It was fucking great to use because it just changes and run you. Looks like your computer's about to blow up. You're like, what the fuck is going on? And then it settles. It's great. Um, yeah, I've told you that. So these are the con contributor stuff. The box, the box has also got this flap on it as well because when you see it, it's tore down the bottom of the box so you can get paper in and out. So the whole thing has a bottom flap on it. Again, every single detail we try to incorporate. Gavin Turk, the artist, he wrote a piece about um, the moment in there about the maze and about the uncanny, which are ideas that are in it. Margaret Howell, fashion designer, she designed a jacket that Jack wears in the film. And we spoke to Margaret about how all that came around. She fucking hates the film, she thinks it's shit. Um, but she remembers quite vividly getting a phone call from the studio asking for 13 jackets. And they had to make them like really quick and get them delivered to the set. And that's because Jack Nicholson had loads of Margaret Howell clothes and he wanted to wear. We, the, yeah, Jack Nicholson apparently wears one piece of his own clothing in every single film he does. That in the show, it's his jacket. Um, there it is, that jacket. Um, and the other thing I really was quite interested in, the whole thing, I think I'll talk about this in a second, I can't remember. Um, within it, these three, this is where all the images are kept, they're kept in these deep blue booklets. And they're a lot, a bit like the LA, there's, there's, a, there's a full booklet on images that inspired the film, there's a full booklet on cultural stuff after it, and then there's a full booklet on art that's in the hotel itself, so like on the walls. So this is a painting by Alex Colville, a Canadian artist, and this is home when you see it in the film. And there's an entire booklet just on what artwork they chose to decorate the hotel. And all that sounds like, what the fuck are you talking about? Why have you done that? But it's kind of, it's, again, this is what the beauty of the film is. Because you can read into it, all the kind of paintings that are in there were all done by Canadian war artists, people that were painting whilst they were fighting in the two world wars. Why? I don't know. They're all really kind of dark, quite moody, some of them that explicitly violent. But they're just there in the background and you wonder, are these things there for a reason? Is that a creative decision? Is that an idea to make you subliminally a bit on edge because the paintings are a little bit dark and it's a kind of peripheral thing that you're absorbing when you're watching these films? But there it is there on the corner. Could have kind of smack it a bit. Um, you know, they're all over, so we we pulled, we, we took we took fucking ages to find them, you know, screen grabbing and Google image searching and reading loads of stuff to find them. Some of them are really easy to find because they're well known and well talked about. Others were really hard, and but all of that is that this visual culture. This is the scrapbook, the hotels. One of the hotels was uh, mentored by Frank Lloyd Wright, which is where they brought the box from. But this is what the whole thing looks like. And this was printed on scrapbook paper within the in the thing. But there it is in the film. And it's just full of newspaper cuttings. Um, it got cut from the film, actually. You can see it in the archive again. That this that was supposed to be like the poisoned apple kind of fairy tale idea. You know, that he sells his soul to the hotel in return for that scrapbook, which then is supposed to inspire him to write this book about the hotel. And that's supposed to what happened, but it got cut out of there. But he's still fought, it's a ghost really in the film itself. It floats around, you see it on the edge of stuff. So we riffed off that as well. And the carpet. Um, the box top is, is lined with a flock, which is like a carpet, kind of furry material, which we printed the carpet on, so that you get that kind of texture. And even that bastard thing, people read into that so much. There's a shot, the shot you see there, this ball rolls into shot where Danny's playing, and, it just, and he doesn't go and sent it, and he shouts for his mum. But then he stands up, and the whole, and the shot, the carpet pattern has completely changed the whole way around. 360 gone round, it's normally like the, the grid of it is locked, he's locked inside it. Now you can just think, ah, <laughs> I'm fucked up there, Con continuity error, then you think about that. But then it happens all the time, so you have to start to think, well, what is it? But it was designed by a guy called David Hicks, a 
really famous interior designer in London. And uh, he did loads of stuff on other films in the 60s and stuff. But they made their own version of it. The colorway was never commercially available. You can buy it now. But we also, there's another fucking spectacular carpet in one of the rooms, which we did with a, a special edition of 237, which is like purple and green and phallic, which no one really knows much about. Um, but we did that, and the key fob is a replica of the, this is the room, 237, which is essentially the like, if the, if the hotel is evil, that's where it lives, in that room, because that's where all the fucking shit comes down. Uh, and that was an engraved piece of Gravopoli, uh, yeah, Gravopoli, Trafalite, whatever you want to call it, um, which is a standardised industrial material, which you can get by. So, the whole thing, what, yeah, I'm going to stop talking in a second. Like, the whole premise of this thing, as I said before, like, they, these books have to have a purpose. But this is not just me geeking out on films a lot. Like, I think it's really important that these say something. Like, they live was all about my politics, and it was about my opinions on that, and Reaganism and Thatcherism and me not really liking, you know, capitalism. Again, here we go. Flags, please. <laughs> and this, this film is about a film that has been... There's so much written about this, and I was really intimidated about it initially. I thought, what the fuck am I going to say about this? And then I just started reading what I had written about it. And it was all fucking men writing about fucking men. No one gives a shit about anyone else but Jack Nicholson in this film, or Stanley Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick is a director, he's obsessed with men. All of his stories are about men. He gets close with eyes wide shut to being fucking vaguely interested in Nicole Kidman and then goes, nah, let's talk about Tom Cruise. <laughs> Every single fucking film. Even like Spartacus is about fucking bronzed up oily blokes. <laughs> so, Barry Lyndon is about What's it called? Barry Lyndon. So is that a female name? Is it? <laughs> it's a period drama that you About a bloke? Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> called fucking Barry. <laughs> So, he, he was obsessed with men, and I just thought, I mean, I'm, I'm a man, how the fuck do I have any validity to not talk about men? So that's why we skewered a lot of the contributors and the collaborators to invite to see what women thought about this. To talk about domestic violence, which is something that no one talks about, but actually, you could, you know, Jack might be fucking haunted, what an excuse. You know, Jack might have mental health issues, what an excuse. He has no excuse when he's not being talked to, to talk to his family the way he talks to his family, to behave the way he behaves around his family. Why isn't that talked about? Why is that not a central theme of the film? The whole, there's a whole thing in horror called The Final Girl, which if, you, if you're into film you might know about. Ultimately it's that kind of cliché that people talk about. It's a trope, not a cliché, but that there's always a woman that survives the whole thing. And some people think that's a really good thing. Other people think it's really misogynistic. But when you start to you start to talk about escaping horror and you start to talk about domestic violence and domestic abuse. The first thing, largely male, again, largely bloke said, why don't you just leave? And it's a fucking ignorant thing. And I thought, that means talking about Because everybody says that uh, Shelley Duvall got absolutely railroaded with her in criticism for this film. Everybody said she got called like a wet dishcloth and everything in the press. And she, when you watch it, is one of the reasons why it is so fucking terrifying. It's, it's fucking incredible what she had to do. And she was abused by Tammy Krubin, for argument's sake. Um, I, think it's, I think it's fairly clear, clear to see. In the making of this film, her hair was falling out. He was telling people not to, don't, I can't remember what the exact word is, but to paraphrase, he sort of says, don't give her any sympathy. It's not going to help. And people like think, oh, that's because he wants to get a performance out of her. She's a fucking actor, for fuck's sake. Let her do her job. She thinks she needs punishing to look punished. So I, th I thought it was about time that all that stuff was discussed and talked about, and I platformed other people to talk about it because I'm a fucking bloke, so I, it's not, I don't have any validity in that. So that's the purpose of this book, to sort of reappraise those things. So the next ones are coming, we're doing others. But in short, I'm in that position, I guess, now, where I do these projects, and I start my own projects, and I have this kind of authorial kind of practice where my opinion is, is kind of valuable and, and directional in, the kind of, in a portion of the work we do and that is a real luxury but I'm not there because I'm good I'm not there because I've 
got something that you don't are not in any way, shape or form better than you might be or have better ideas than you might have. I just have found ways to sort of do these things and you can do that as well. You definitely can, trust me. And I think all you've got to do is, like what I said right at the beginning, you've just got to realise that what your differences might be are actually strengths and your ideas can only come from you and if you back them and you work at them and you, you know, play that game in some respects, why can't you do what you want to do? I never in a million years thought I'd be doing this hard. I sat on this fucker for years thinking that everyone just that fucking won't let me off in pyjamas. They'd think I'm fucking stupid. They'd just laugh me out of town and I'd finally got the courage to talk about it somewhat and they've backed it. It took years for that to happen. But it's not anything to do with anything else other than just being vocal about it and sharing and being open about it and not really caring about where these things come from or how they might go and how they might shape, but just fucking getting on with it. So yeah, that's me. I'm done. Four, eight, seven. <laughs> <laughs> 